This speaker is the first Associate Director for Data Science appointed at the National Institutes of Health. Formerly, he was the Associate Chan Vice Chancellor for Innovation in Industry Alliances, a professor in the Department of Pharmacology in Skaggs of the Skaggs School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Cal California, San Diego, the Associate Director of RCSB at the Protein Data Bank, and, and an adjunct professor at the Stanford Burnham Institute. I welcome to you Dr. Philip Bourne. Thank you, Karen. It's very nice to be here, and uh, I've enjoyed the morning so far. Um, so, as was said, I'm actually the first person in this job, and it's really, um, I guess I don't know how far I can think ahead, but I decided you're having a day. Um, I'm thinking in months, and also grants tend to be on average of the order of four years, so that's sort of uh, at least some of the thinking that goes into the title. Um, so what, what I'm, the question I'm going to kind of address here today is uh, what is NIH's overall approach to data and what does it mean to you? Uh, and I know some of you here are not, uh, in fact, in the biomedical arena, um, and so, but I think this kind of generalizes uh, and, and certainly based on discussions I've started to have with the other agencies, uh, which I've, frankly there hasn't been enough of in the past, um, I th you know, I think it translates. So just let me give you a little context of how um, things got started, at least in the NIH space. Um, uh, the director of the NIH, Francis Collins, uh, realized several years ago that, uh, that, the, that the data revolution was coming to biomedicine and uh, uh, convened a working group to look at it. And that led to a report, which the findings you can see here on the screen, um, it's kind of things that are fairly obvious, um, sharing, uh, cataloging, training, the kinds of things we heard about today already. Um, one thing I would emphasize that is the idea of support for all of this throughout the research life cycle. So this has to go on from almost from the moment that ideas are formulated to leading to hypotheses, to uh, questions that are asked, to data that's generated using software, uh, which leads to results which are then disseminated, including uh, in the literature, but now increasingly in other ways, which has been mentioned. And another part of that was the idea that there would be someone to sort of uh, lead this initiative, and uh, which I think is an expression of the importance of this, this, this kind of role. And in fact, I report d directly to Francis Collins in this role, and it seemed very uh, important within the NIH. It got kicked off uh, by uh, Eric Green, who's the director of the Human Genome in Institute initially, uh, and that led to something called the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative. So I'm going to sort of uh, not talk too much about uh, these things or that initiative per se, but some of the findings and some of the directions that we're going in, uh, which I think is important to institutions like Yale, uh, because not only will it tell you where the funding uh, areas are likely to go, but I think it also speaks to uh, a general philosophy of what we're, how we're thinking about things within the NIH and how I'm interested, I'm interested to see how that mirrors to what goes on uh, in an institution such as this. Because we refer things, as you'll see in a moment, to the notion of uh, the NIH becoming a digital enterprise. And in many ways, that's kind of what we're talking about here. And that has some very interesting connotations, I think. Um, so let me just give you a little uh, my own bias, because uh, so you can take with what I say with a grain of salt. Uh, until six months ago, I was a tenured faculty member at UCSD and I gave up the sunshine and tenure to do this. Um, but uh, I certainly don't think as a Fed at this point in time, and hopefully I never will. Um, and I'm also very much into the e-science and open science movements of which I've been part of for a number of years. So let me give you a few observations that uh, we haven't necessarily heard about, um, uh, I'd say, uh, today so far. So first one is we talk about the promise of this big data but I would argue we don't even know uh, the value of the little data. We don't really know the value of the data that we've already got. At least from the point of view of the federal agencies, we don't actually ask the right questions. We ask questions like, okay, well, how many terabytes are you generating? How many people are accessing them? And, and, and that's about it, you know. But when you start digging down into the granularity of the data, who's accessing what 
data object or research object, when and why? And those are the sorts of questions that are not asked, which is kind of ironic because those are the questions that data-oriented companies ask themselves every day. And one of the reasons I would surmise that we don't ask these questions uh, is because we don't actually think as a business. We don't think in terms of supply and demand about this. And my argument would be, going forward, we're going to have to think about this uh, 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 as much more as a business than we do today. Because what we're doing, as you'll see, and I'll emphasize this a few times, just doesn't scale. Um, so we've already heard about the value of curation and, and so forth. And, but you know, that is expensive in terms of time and money. And when you do that, it's at the price of something else. And the question is, what is that something else, and how do you evaluate uh, how, much you should, how, you know, how much time and money should be spent? These are not uh, simple questions. And then if you start to look at data retroactively, it becomes really expensive. And I know this from personal experience with something like the Protein Data Bank, where for several years we spent about 40% of our budget retroactively reviewing and, and essentially homogenizing the data that we already had so that we could actually com do comparative analysis that no one perceived as being important when we first started collecting this data, but became comp uh, important later on. So we're now much more educated about the importance of, uh, of, of this kind of activity, um, but if you have to do things retroactively, it's very expensive. And then I would say, and you'll see how we're structuring our thinking in a moment, uh, but I would just say that good data begats trust, Trust, trust begats community, and community is God. What I mean by that is the idea that nothing that we do, being the NIH, uh, should really be done without the, the community driving it. And we just know from previous experience in a, a series of different resources that that community gets, has to trust in what we, what's being done. And you know, good, da good data is, is essentially key to that. And we certainly experience that in, again, I'll just cite my experience with the Protein Data Bank, um, that getting that community trust probably took five years of running the resource. Uh, and that involved engaging the community in every single step of what we were doing around defining standards, uh, around uh, the kinds of uh, applications that we provided uh, on the data and so forth. Uh, as I said already, what we're doing is not sustainable. I mean, you can be a first grader and you see two graphs. If you look at biomedical research and you look at the current um, funding levels, and I, I, I'm anticipating that these aren't going to change significantly in the next several years, they are decreasing uh, in biomedical in, uh, adjusted inflation dollars. And yet, any, any graph you want to look at vis-a-vis -vis the data, it's growing uh, at, at huge rates in the, in the way that we just heard in the previous talk. So, you know, how do you reconcile this? And I think, uh, so s this then comes into this idea that we really don't have a business model right now, uh, currently for scientific data. If I look at a few observations vis-a-vis uh, -vis what's going on at the NIH that needs to be addressed, is we have little idea how we spend, uh, how much we spend on data. I went round, there are 27 institutes and centers at NIH focusing on different diseases, different organs and so on. I went round to every single one of the directors and I asked two fundamental questions. You know, how much are you spending on data-related activities? And, how, and then the harder one was, how much do you think you should be spending? Um, what we do know, approximately, because uh, we've scraped extramural databases and so forth and looked at things intramurally, that we're probably spending well over a billion dollars a year on data-related activities. It's probably much more than that, actually. And of course, how you define it makes it a little difficult. But uh, we don't have much idea on what we should be spending. And that brings out a natural tension. Um, the tension is a sort of a culture clash between the more observation, in, in terms of biomedicine, the more observational history and the new analytical approaches to discovery. And there's tension within uh, organizations, uh, whether they be uh, you know, medical centers, um, uh, academic medical centers, or whether they be the NIH. Uh, about those relative those constituencies, so th it's it's these are all things that uh, that need to be considered. So let's see here. Uh, okay. So 
the observation I would make for an academic medical center is the idea that the, it, it's not that different to what we have at the NIH. You have a set of effectively uh, of, of silos of information. And what you're trying, what we're moving towards with this notion of a digital enterprise uh, is really breaking down those silos to some extent. And I think data is an example of a catalyst that can make that happen. So an example of that would be, and maybe it exists here, but I haven't actually encountered it anywhere else yet, is, and I actually wrote about this in an article, but the, uh, is the idea that if you look at students coming in, increasingly those students are doing at least part of their training online. They're, they're, they're taking online testing and so on. But if a student does exceptionally well in a particular fragment of a course, then at, there, there's no way currently for really that information to be conveyed to the professor who has a profile which, which would indicate that they're an expert in that particular area. So that kind of cross-connection could highlight to you the kinds of students uh, that would be, uh, would be really valuable. Unless you're actually teaching that course, you probably wouldn't uh, make that connection. And that's just one trivial example uh, of the kinds of cross-cutting that can take place. Um, and that, to me, is the whole idea uh, of this digital enterprise. So within uh, the Associate uh, Director for Data Science Office, we've come up with a mission statement that sort of reflects this. The second part of that uh, in italics is really just taken from the NIH mission itself. But what, what we're trying to do and what's going to be reflected in funding calls and so forth is help enable this notion of an ecosystem that takes us to this digital enterprise where we uh, increase the rate of discovery uh, by virtue of how we use data. So it's, it's more than just about big data. Although big, and I, I'm not necessarily a fan of the term big data. Uh, for reasons I'll get to in a bit, but I think the important thing about it is it brought me here, it, brought, you know, it, it actually brings attention to the whole problem, and, and I think that, that's, uh, that's, that's definitely a good thing. So I guess the, one of the things we need to ask ourselves is what, what are the kinds of things we're trying to solve? So one of them, which I've been harping on already, is sustainability. So uh, if, if we have this model where we can't currently sustain what we're supporting, what are we going to do? Well, right now what we do as a federal agency is we fund something, we fund something, and then one day we say there's no more money. And, you know, that's not a healthy model. I mean, another model is, to, is an example would be what I would call a 50% business model. So we're going to say, here's a grant. This year you're going to get all the money you've had in the past to sustain this data. But that's going to ramp down by a certain amount for the next four years until it's at a 50% level. So you've got this amount of time to actually figure out how to uh, sustain that data more efficiently, and that could, that could mean a number of things. Um, it can mean a partner, it can be merging, it can mean a, a whole a series of things. Um, so, you know, the, that's just one example. Other examples, efficiency. Uh, we already heard a little about the issues with patient data and, and, and having uh, access. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is the notion of uh, the trusted investigator. So right now, if you want to, for example, access data in a resource called dbGaP, which is uh, genotype to phenotype information, every time you want to do that, you have to go and, and get uh, new approval. Uh, there's the notion of being a trusted investigator where you actually have a blanket approval that allows you to access this data. Of course, if you lose that trust uh, through some event, then um, it's like being uh, disbarred, I suppose. So we're looking at this kind of model. I'm not saying that's actually going to happen, but I think uh, there's definitely a uh, need for creativity in this kind of space. Uh, reproducibility has been touched on here today a little already, but clearly this is something that really worries uh, the folks where I sit at the NIH. So you can imagine the situation that the, uh, a congressman and woman is sitting there reading the newspaper and reads, as has been published, that whatever it was, 60 to 70 percent of seminal cancer studies could not be reproduced. Um, and they say to my, themselves, why on earth are we giving the National Cancer Institute four and a half billion dollars a year if all this work can't be reproduced? This has potentially very worrying ripple effects uh, throughout the research enterprise because all of that would trickle down uh, if that happens. So there's a, a very avid effort right now uh, with across all of the 27 institutes and centers to actually look at this reproducibility problem. And clearly, data accessibility, software accessibility, in fact, accessibility of all the research objects within the enterprise um, 
uh, is, a, a, is a, a, a step in that direction of dealing with it. Um, and then the whole accessibility. We were in a situation where when clinical trials are run, uh, there was suddenly a discovery that many clinical trials weren't even registered, even though that's the law. So there are lots of uh, these kinds of nuances around clinical uh, data as well. And then I'll say a little more about trainees in a second. So the idea is to create, uh, help foster an ecosystem. And I see that ecosystem as effectively a three-legged stool. There's the community, there's the policies that go uh, into place, which is sort of the top-down. So I would see that these are essentially the policy is sort of a top-down approach and the community is a bottom-up approach. And then, of course, you need the infrastructure to support all of this. Um, and then on top of all of that, I think what you really need is you need uh, the notion of a virtuous research cycle. And this was actually drawn at a recent workshop we had, um, a sort of advisory group that came in to uh, provide some information. This was actually d drawn by uh, uh, Dave Glazer, from, uh, the chief engineer at Google, uh, and the, the notion is that none of this is going to happen without there being the value to the investigator who's going to be required to do some of this. We can put policies in place, but if there's no value in doing so to the investigator, getting them to do it is going to be extremely difficult. So these things need to be harnessed such that when we do some of this, whatever it is, whatever policy we put in place, whatever infrastructure we put in place, we do so in such a way that it's, it adds value to uh, what can be done with research. So that's, that's the notion behind all of this. Uh, what are we doing to seed this kind of uh, new ecosystem? Uh, well, my office is actually very small, uh, but there are a whole series of people across the 27 institutes and centers that participate. And this year we're spending about $30 million on this, and next year it's gonna be of the order of uh, $80 million. Most of that money goes to the extramural community to uh, enable, help foster this uh, ecosystem. So uh, we have a whole organization associated with that, and I won't go into that, and a whole bunch of people are doing it. So what are the kind, so let's, let's take each leg of this stool and look at what it is that we're dealing with that we need to deal with. Well, at this, you know, that we're talking about a pretty complex system here. So aside from the agencies, the NIH itself, there's many other agencies uh, that are all part of this that we're now uh, interacting with. And there are many other government uh, branches that all feed into this. And at the same time, we're all driven by uh, various initiatives, particularly the Holdren Memo, that relates to open data. So there, there is now you know, a mandate that this data has to be made available, which is really the driver. What I've learned in my brief time in government is it's also referred to, of course, as a non-funded non mandate. So all of this has to happen without any additional funds from the federal government to support it. So this, you know, this, this brings into question uh, the sustainability issue again. And then the private sector is involved in all of this. And I think one of the uh, pushes that I really wanted to have in going to the NIH that uh, Francis Collins is supporting is the idea that we do much more with pr the private sector than has previously done, been done before. And so that involves pharmaceutical companies, uh, IT providers, and so on. And then there's a whole series of organizations uh, that play into this. And I think what we're doing uh, and looking to do with these, uh, with these folks is they, they're representative communities we haven't actually necessarily interacted with very much in the past, particularly, for example, statisticians, computer scientists, mathematicians. So we're really looking, and I'll give you one or two examples of things that we're doing to foster that kind of uh, new interaction. But it's clear that this, this, all of these types of people need to be brought into the mix if we're going to uh, enable this ecosystem. So that's one leg of the store. Uh, so what about policies as another leg? Uh, well, clearly, we need much better data, clinical data harmonization. So the idea that if you have uh, one set of represented clinical data uh, that's being collected uh, in, in one type of electronic health record, that in fact, uh, and another, that uh, there's some level of synergy between, that the, some a level of synergy can be got. That is very difficult right now. Anyone who's worked with this kind of data, and this is true of other data types as well, um, it knows what the problems are. Even though we have standards for, for some of the information that's within those records. So, but we, we need to do much more. We need new standards. Uh, we need uh, reasons to adopt those standards. 
uh, and we need examples where they've actually been adopted and they're working well. Um, another example policy which is uh, relatively new within is much more of a notion of adoption of the cloud. So there was, there's been a lot of resistance within NIH to the cloud uh, across the NIH, but now there are a series of cloud pilots in different institutes, and I'm going to give you an example of something that's going on in a minute. Um, but dbGaP is this uh, genotype to phenotype database that is, uh, we now have a go-ahead to move that into the cloud, into a HIPAA-compliant cl cloud. Uh, another thing is the notion of data citation. So this is what I was alluding to when I made a comment earlier this morning, is elevating the value of data within the scholarship enterprise. And the idea is that, uh, so there's a technical nuance with this which makes it uh, uh, feasible, uh, more feasible than it was before. So what happens when a journal article gets published uh, in the biomedical sciences, that's represented in an XML format that's JATS, so-called JATS compliant. So that's then ingested by PubMed and PubMed Central and made available to the community, either as an abstract or as a full text. So what's happened is there's an extension to that JATS which supports data citation. And so that means you can have a machine-readable representation of a data citation, which of course you can then use to generate, as we do for paper citations, different human-readable forms. So we, we're moving towards saying that data citation at the NIH, that data citation is a valid uh, ent entry within your uh, scholarly record, whether it be in your bib sketch when you apply for a grant, if, whether it be in a report uh, associated with that grant. So this, this begins to elevate uh, the value of data. And this is in keeping, of course, with the fact that data journals are now emerging where good quality data sets are valued as part of scholarship. It was mentioned earlier at the beginning with the, the, the libraries are helping with data sharing plans. This is good. Uh, unfortunately, and I say this as a PI, that the current status of data sharing plans is, is basically a joke. Uh, you know, in, in the, first of all, in the NIH, only grants over 500k direct uh, budget per year are required to provide data sharing plans. Well, this, this seems to me to be crazy. It's sort of saying that, uh, that uh, you know, small grant, uh, data generated on small grants doesn't have any value. Uh, d this doesn't make any sense at all. There's a move to move that all will come into play fairly shortly, that all grants, and this is part of the uh, directive from uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy anyway, that, that, that has to be, that all of that data has to be available. Um, so that means all grants will have data sharing plans to describe how that's going to happen. But, you know, we have no, they're not, there's no way that right now that anything is done with, a, with, that, with those plans. They're not enforced. So there's no incentive to do anything with them. But what we're moving towards is the idea very soon that they, there will be more, more enforcement. So that enforcement will come from the idea that, first of all, the machine read, the data sharing plan needs to be machine readable. So, which is ironic actually right now that it isn't, at least parts of it. So for example, we will be able, and you apply for a grant, we will be able to extract from that, that on year two of this grant, you, you're going to put data in resource X. So after two years, there will be an auto automatic trigger that will go out to resource X and see whether, in fact, there are data objects within that grant, uh, within that resource, sorry, that actually have the grant number that, uh, that, uh, you, that you, you, you have. So it's a way of automatically closing the circle. And then, of course, if the data's not in there, there could be good reasons for that. But if, uh, if the data hasn't been shared when it should have been shared, then, you know, we can put a bit of pressure on, uh, on getting, that, uh, in, getting that to happen in a, in a fairly automated way. I mean, these things need to be introduced slowly and carefully, so it's not like this is all going to happen overnight, but this, I'm just giving you a sense of the general movement, uh, which is essentially saying uh, more data should be shared and we need to value that, uh, the, the, the people who do that. Um, on that note of value, we're also looking at different review models. So there's a general notion that data-centric grants within the NIH framework and don't necessarily review very well. That the study section's doing it, they're, they're generally part of uh, other study sections, or are they part of a study section where the, the emphasis may, for example, be more on experimental work and the data part doesn't get reviewed very well. So we're looking at ways uh, of dealing with that. And we're gonna do some experiments this FY15, which starts actually next month. Um, 
So one of the things we're going to experiment with with some of this uh, big data to knowledge funding next year is in fact open grants and open review. So if you have a, you know, and you know, many investigators won't want to do that. They'll feel that they're giving too much away. But we'll see whether for more data-oriented grants there's interest in doing this. So the grant itself would be open and accessible for people to look at. Uh, and also um, the review process itself and, and the reviewers would be open. Uh, it may be that we don't get any applicants and we don't get any reviewers. Uh, but, it, you know, these are the experiments that I think we want to, to actually try. Um, I mean, of course, the one driver in an optimistic sense might be, well, you know, supposing you're writing a grant on, a, on some form of uh, rare disease. Well, it doesn't get funded, so what would happen to that now? Essentially, it would go into a black hole, uh, potentially resurrect itself in a different form in a year from now, right? Um, here is an opportunity that it would be out there and an advocacy group or, you know, a blue button or red button, whatever you want to put on it, could actually be put onto this to, to try and raise funds to support that grant. So whether that will how foundations and so on could potentially pick it up who wouldn't normally have known about it. Um, so, and there are other, I won't go into a lot of details, but there are other uh, sort of approaches for this. Okay, so let's, let's go to the, another leg of the school. Let's go to the, uh, the commons. Uh, which is part of the infrastructure. So we're actually, in the next week or two, we're standing up something which we call the commons. Uh, and effectively what that is, is we have, what by these directives that come all the way from the President of the United States, we have the why for data sharing, but what we don't have is the how. And then we have an end game, and we have different types of data. So those different types of data, a lot of which is, of course, the long tail. So it's all this data that, according to these directives, is going to need to be made accessible in some form, which right now probably languishes on a lab desktop or somewhere in the lab for a while and then disappears. Um, that is you know, an example of long tail data. So potentially, and, the, and often that, that data doesn't have a home. It doesn't fit into a traditional resource where uh, things go. And then there's a whole series of high throughput experiments that are done in biomedicine. Uh, you know, what happens to that data? Right now there are core facilities that provide that data to investigators, which are funded by the NIH, but they don't actually maintain that data typically for very long either. So that's another uh, form of data. And then, of course, there's the special needs of clinical uh, and patient data. Uh, and then associated with that is the end game that we want out of all of this, of course, which is, you know, some high-quality data that's usable for which discovery can be made and so on. And then in the middle, there's a series of stakeholders. It's not just NIH awardees. Uh, it's the rest of academia, it's the private sector, and it's other government agencies. And so what we're doing is we're putting together an environment uh, that only we're, only... we're standing this up and we're going to test it out. It's going to be a small project, a more small agile approach um, through a thing we call the commons. And the, the awards that we're about to make are need, those folks that have those awards are going to need to be commons compliant. So what does that mean? Um, I'll explain that in a second. But the, the basic idea of being in the commons is at the, at the simplest level, it provides a Dropbox-like storage. So you can drag and drop uh, NIH-related or other, for that matter, information and data. Uh, it brings compute to the data, because uh, in, in large part, this initially at least, will be with cloud providers. And it provides a place to, uh, in principle, to collaborate and discover. So that's sort of, you know, the, the beginnings of what it's going to look like. But I don't think any of this is going to work without what I alluded to earlier is a new kind of business model. And what we're looking at in the longer term uh, is uh, a business model that changes the way that we currently fund computing uh, across uh, the, uh, the NIH. Again, this will not be, ish, this will not be done en masse. It will be done in, in, a, in a set of trial agile experiments to see whether there's value in this. But we believe we can get much more compute value than we currently get. So you take a series of commons compliant resources, and their compliance it revol only involves two things, which is still under discussion. But one of them is that whatever goes in there, whatever research object goes into the commons, has to have some form of identifier. So it can actually be indexed and found. And that, that finding will be done by an award that's already been made that's going to be funded as of October the 3rd. 
Um, and then beyond that, there will be a set of provenance for each of those research objects, and then a series of metadata depending on the object type. At the, at the beginning, that will be very, what's required will be very, very uh, cursory and limited. It's really about providing attribution for the, whatever's put into the commons. And so that's, that's the commons, and there's a set, it, with a set of commons compliant resources that could be HPC facilities, they could be government labs, it could be public clouds, it could be private clouds. As long as they conform to these rules, we can find the information, the, the research objects are in there, and they can be operated on. And then the value of this is the business model. And the business model basically says, um, rather than giving you money to go out and buy your own computers and other, we're going to give you credit to spend in a commons compliant resource. And you can spend that credit wherever you want. So if you do work that has, is very compute intense, but on a limited set of data, you'll probably go to a different provider than if you have a lot of data and minimal compute because they have different charging algorithms associated with that. So that drives competition in the marketplace. Uh, then what happens is you get that credit, you spend that credit at a commons comp compliant resource. The resource bills the bro a broker service, the broker bills the NIH, the NIH pays one bill a month, which goes back to the broker that distributes this across all of the, uh, the commons compliant resources. So this is something that uh, we want to try, and we believe that we can get uh, significantly more compute resource for the dollar than we currently, in the way that we currently spend uh, compute money. So we'll be experimenting with this uh, across uh, 2000, uh, across FY15, again, with specific applications that support the whole research life cycle. So there's, there's actually motivation for working in this space. So it's the opportunity to actually do real science in this kind of environment. It's not just trying to build it and they'll come kind of thing. We'll look for specific applications that are really going to work in this kind of environment. Um, so, and then I think the last thing I would say is really about uh, training and diversity. We've touched on this, but I think the, there's really the need, uh, it's sort of at the center of these uh, of these three parts of the, uh, these three legs of the stool. But uh, without that, uh, you know, I think we're, we're going to be in some trouble. And part of the issue I would say that, that, that bothers me, I can illustrate with a little story. So when I was in San Diego, um, Google didn't have an office in San Diego. They had an office in Irvine, which is about uh, 60 miles away. So what they would do is they would run a pretty fancy bus every day uh, from San Diego to Irvine to take Google employees up there. Well, what I noticed over a period of several years is more and more of the folks in my lab were actually getting on that bus. And to me, that was, that's somewhat disturbing for a variety of reasons. But now I'm at the NIH, it's disturbing because quite often those people have been trained to do various types of biomedicine, and yet they're now perhaps doing something completely different. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but... Um, it, it, it illustrates a strain or a loss to the biomedical infrastructure and research enterprise. And when you, when you probe as to why some of those people are leaving, yes, on an NIH grant, you're never going to be able to offer someone the salary they're likely to get at Google. But some of those people did not want to leave. They, want, they were scholars and they wanted to be appreciated as scholars. And they felt as data scientists in the academic system, Many of them weren't treated as, as, as formal scholars. And I think there's a general recognition that this, this is a problem. And in fact, we're in the throes of organizing a workshop with the National Science Foundation to actually bring in uh, VPs of research, vice chancellors of research, and so forth, to actually sit and address this sort of problem of how to uh, really recognize these people. And I think there's a willingness to do this because there's a growing... Uh, realization, and I know this because I was a, a part-time administrator at a university until recently, that there's a, the potential to lose money, i.e. through indirects, because grants are going elsewhere because there aren't the cadre of data scientists to support them within that institution. And the kind of centre I heard about earlier today I, obviously is a, a good way of addressing that. And I think we, we would be uh, very uh, interested in, in con figuring out ways for how we can support that kind of enterprise. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, and I think another aspect which where a place like Yale could be really helpful is really, I think, uh, given uh, 
portion of our budget that goes into diversity, the idea that we have uh, partnering grants with, uh, with other uh, smaller institutions uh, where, where you know, that can foster diversity, where those people can come and they can do joint training in places like, uh, like Yale. Um, uh, you know, th this is something we're exploring for next year. Um, and we're actually really doing a whole assessment of what we fund in respect to training in data science across all of the NIH because uh, it's clear that in, in we're, not, we're not necessarily being uh, as effective as we could be. There are certain institutes, for example, that are all, all funding the same kind of thing when that could have... Act, uh, and then there are other areas of important data science that are just not getting addressed. So these are just examples uh, of what we might do um, with respect to training. Um, and there will be certainly diff uh, additional uh, training grants. Uh, I was mentioning earlier that there's also, I think, we definitely support the idea uh, of libraries being an active uh, player in the data science arena. Uh, and I think we're actually going to uh, provide some grants probably this, uh, this fiscal year where there will be the opportunity to apply for funds where to encourage librarians to further engage with researchers uh, around the data curation, uh, the data distribution, and the data use uh, problems. So I guess it's much better to have a dialogue, and we, we're going to hear some other comments. And I've, I've purposely not said too much about the clinical space, because I think that's going to come up next. Um, but I'd say the closing question is, you know, uh, I sit each week now in the office of the director, and we have a meeting every week where we spend half of that meeting really describing the efforts that have gone on on the Hill that week to try and get more money for the NIH. And, you know, there's a very, it's very interesting going from being an outsider to an insider. And I think every researcher ought to have a window into the NIH to see how, peop, how much they try to get more money to support biomedical research. But the fact of the matter is, as hard as they try, uh, you know, it's, that hasn't changed. Uh, you know, so, you know, so the question is, we're now asking ourselves, given that flat budget, what can our office do to improve data science activities? Because it's absolutely clear that this, the level, the types of analytics that are coming in biomedical research through the advent of this data really require us to change the way we're doing things. And that's the sort of cultural shift I was sort of alluding to earlier. And that's out, without a doubt the hardest thing to do of all. So I'll just stop there, and uh, I guess we're going to have... Our next speaker is Dr. Amy Justice, who will respond to Mr. Bourne's presentation. Um, Amy is professor of medicine at the Yale School of Medicine, professor of public health at the Yale School of Public Health, and section chief of general internal medicine in the VA Connecticut healthcare system. She has conducted research focusing on outcomes in chronic HIV infection for more than 20 years. Please welcome Dr. Justice. Thank you. Uh, before getting into a response, I thought it might be helpful to tell a story. Uh, I came into the informatics, big data world by accident. I, I'm a general internist. I went to medical school. When I went to medical school, I told the interviewers I wasn't interested in doing research. I wanted to be leader in primary care. I was very interested in figuring out how we could provide primary care more efficiently and appropriately to all people in the United States. That was my my goal as a young individual. And as I went to medical school, I began to realize that uh, I came from a legal background, and I questioned everything. And you know, that doesn't work very well on the wards. People don't really like that. They say, we do this because we do this. They don't want to have 20 questions about why we were ordering this test or that test or the other test. So I, I quickly realized that maybe research was a little bit more my cup of tea, because in research, it's good to question everything, right? And then I started to, to rotate onto the VA health services. So uh, for those of you who don't know, the VA has a national electronic medical record system. It's had it for a very long time. Uh, it's extremely complete and integrated. 
uh, with the VA healthcare system. So pharmacy fill and refill data is in there. We know about what medications people are taking. We know all their laboratories. If they go to one VA in Florida during the winter and another VA in Connecticut during the summer, we can follow them from those two places. It's really a pretty amazing system, and it's been fully paperless for more than a decade. So as I was training, I began to realize this is a gold mine. There's an incredible amount of data in this system. And so I started to ask people, so if I wanted to do some research on this data, how do I get it out of the system? And people said, I don't have a clue. You, you can't get it out. Once it goes in, it's there. <laughs> it was sort of this magical thing. Well, then I began to talk to some programmers and to learn a little bit about what was behind the scenes and about how you might be able to get that data out. And eventually, I was able to pull the data out in a small way. And that was the beginning of my career. I've built a cohort study of veterans aging with and without HIV infection in the VA that now has 15 years of observational data from the electronic medical record system. And it's supplemented by a number of other sources. The reason I drag you through that story is that I think that it tells you a some of the issues that we're going to face as we think about at least one form of big data, which is the medical record data. Uh, I have been asked questions at NIH like, okay, so you're going to build the cohort. Who's going to do the science? Just to illustrate the divide between what's considered science at NIH and what isn't considered science at NIH. I've also been told, well, this is a purely observational study. Uh, meaning that, therefore, it's not scientific. Uh, these are biases that if team science, if big data, if all of the things that Phil mentioned as being really important are going to happen, have to be overcome. We have to get over our biases. We have to understand that people who understand observational data are an important member of the team. And along those lines, we need to learn to trust each other, which is something that Phil was absolutely mentioning. Um, something that is not easy for people who need to get their next grant funded to do. It's also sometimes not easy because our institutions make it more difficult, and Phil and I have discussed some of those issues. But one of the things that I would like to hear about is how are we going to improve the responsiveness to observational science and the value of observational science uh, in this new domain? Oh, here, sorry. So let, let me just say that I think there's some precedents for this history here, uh, perhaps it's in slightly different domains, for what has happened. And uh, Mark Gerstein and I can certainly attest to this because we're in the area of computational biology. But I remember, and so it's really a, a his, tracing a historical uh, progression and then comparing it to what you're, you know, where we are and what, what, what you want to happen. So I'd say that what in the 80s, when those of us doing uh, biology or uh, medicine playing with computers were, were really outsiders. We were novel, we were geeks, we were very strange people. And then what ch happened is that the Human Genome Project came along. And that was really, in my mind at least, uh, a milestone because not for, for merely for the fact of what it produced scientifically, but it actually legitimized uh, the informatics enterprise. because. At the time, I was working on a, uh, a Columbia, and we were looking at the physical and genetic mapping of chromosome 13. You could not take that grant on without having not just a data sharing plan, and not sorry, not data, not data uh, storing and, and manipulating the data, but you had to make that data available. You had to do a series of things, uh, and of course, the analytics associated with that data became uh, became important. And in fact, we actually were able to improve the experimental protocols by virtue of what we could show analytically. So that, for the first time, forced us together and created a synergy between, between those, two, those two groups. Um, and then, you know, things went not quite as planned. I'd say what happened at that point uh, is that there was a, a sudden realization, well, maybe this, this, this is the next big wave. And so half of the, the few of us who were doing bioinformatics uh, actually went off to industry because industry was offering great packages and so forth uh, with the belief that this was going to be the next huge wave. Well, five, three to five years later, those people are all looking for academic jobs again because it hadn't actually realized, re uh, it hadn't been realized. It took much longer 
to appreciate for that value to become a uh, part of the mainstream. And then I think we went into a mode where uh, doing this kind of science became almost was considered a kind of service provision. It was necessary now, but it was a service provision to um, to the, the the traditional way of doing biomedicine. And then I tell you, where we are today is at a point where, yes, you can get tenure and you can get all sorts of rewards for being one of those analytical people uh, working with other people's data. So the, the, it has been within the system, it's been legitimized. And so I think that's, that's a good thing. But I think what I would, I would argue is by the end of the decade, these guys are going to be driving the ship because it's going to be the fundamental part of discovery making. And I think what we're, what we're, that was one of the reasons I went there was to try, to the NIH, was to try and help foster that along. So we're still, we're still at this point where there's, there's sort of a clash of culture. But uh, I think there's, I just, having talked to the leadership across the NIH, across all these institutes, I think there's a realized that when I, I, I essentially just gave that exact spiel to the advisors, to the directors, when uh, not that long ago, a couple of months ago, and no one really pushed back on that. Um, so I, I think there's, like it or not, there's this belief that that's, that's sort of where, where things are going. And I think it's how, it's how, we, make that, uh, how we make that change. And I think from my point of view, when I think about how it's, it's worked the best, it's come from a situation going back to the original field of bioinformatics. When people started doing it, there were a, a group of biologists or biomedical folks, uh, and there were a group of, of different types of people, physicists, chemists, mathematicians, computer scientists, who started to come together. And there was quite a lot of tension in the beginning uh, and quite a lot of misunderstanding. But then what happened is the NIH and others and the NSF started to offer training programs where they were training people at the interface. So they had to have dual mentors. And it was those students, ultimately, that made the glue that really started. And of course, those students now, some of them, of course, are, are full professors in, in, in institutions and, and going forward. So I think we, you know, so we, one of the points is we need to start training people for this new, much better now for this new world order if it, if it is to come. Uh, and put those at the interface between these traditional uh, disciplines. So, and I, that's happening, and I'm encouraged by that. I guess where partly where I'm a little discouraged is when, in, the, in what we're doing with this big data to knowledge initiative, we needed to have um, a multi-council working group because all of the different institutes and centres are NIH funded. So, and the councils, uh, if you don't know, are essentially eminent scientists who advise each of the institutes and centers on, on direction and so forth, and very valuable bodies. But when I looked at those from the point of view of who would be good data scientists to, to help us with our initiative, you know, frankly, I came up short. So, uh, but, you know, I, and then there was a realization, well, that's perhaps true. We, we are my council, I really ought to have someone capable of doing this. So it's a, it's a process, but I think we are moving in the right direction. And then along those lines, uh, once people buy the idea of data sharing, that's not the end, that's the beginning. So uh, our database we share routinely with lots of different investigators, but it's not as though you can just go pull the data, go off, analyze it, write the paper up, and be done. Getting the data elements is the beginning of a dialogue. Uh, what are these elements? What about the missing data? How do I interpret this? What are the standards that have been used as other people have used these da data elements? There's a whole process of back and forth if the science is going to be excellent science. Yeah. And I would imagine that's true in genetics as well, although I'm sure Mark could comment on that. Uh, so there's really a long-term commitment that needs to be made on the part of the investigators sharing the data to the other investigators using the data if the quality of the science is going to be at the highest possible level. Right now, there's no support for that process or that time or that energy. So uh, thoughts about how that might change? Okay, so it's true. And I think it's, it makes no sense to when these resources, one end of it, uh, clearly have 
need to have a very long lifetime, and yet they're funded in you know, three, four, five-year cycles. And that really doesn't lead to sustainability of the system. It leads, in part, of course, to the Google bus syndrome, because <laughs> if you know that if you're doing a good job maintaining this resource and you're communicating with the communities and you're building this rapport, and yet you know that in three to four years you're going to be reviewed and you're not clear it's going to be funded, if and an opportunity comes along for another job, well, you know, it's hard to keep people in the system. So, you know, I think the, the, the longevity uh, aspect has to be dealt with. But at the same time, I think there are, there are other models that need to be thought about. So what's really important is that that the people who do the data work are often very passionate and very knowledgeable about that data. And we have to be very careful that we don't disrupt even the system that we have that to, to uh, make sure that that level of quality persists and even improves based on you know, it's working with the communities. And of course, that's the key. The community tells you, if they tell you it's crap, then, <laughs> then you're going to do something about it because you know, it's part of the cycle. Um, but, you know, I think at the same time, so that needs to be preserved, but at the same time, the way we currently operate a number of these resources, I'm not convinced is necessarily the right way anymore. And what I mean by that is the idea that, first of all, what we've done over many years now is to create effectively stovepipes of information within these resources. And... Um, because they're funded often by different agencies and in different ways and so on. And that was quite effective at a time when you used to go just to a small number of resources to do your research. But now in this translational era, we're going across everything from you know, genomic, proteomic, meta metabolomic, all the way up to, to patient information. And each time we do that, we're, we're struggling with every single one of these resources. So I think at some level, um, uh, obviously, uh, confidentiality notwithstanding, some of that, that data has to be sort of brought, and the idea of the commons is essentially to bring that quality data into a more open framework where, uh, in a sense, it could be more or less crowdsourced. So you might still have the resources you have, but you're now allowing more people easy access to the data to take and build collections of subsets of data that meet these sort of translational needs. So, you know, I think just experimenting with this and seeing whether, in fact, there is any uptake uh, will be an interesting experiment. So one of the things we're going to do with this commons idea is to seed that commons with a set of uh, a, a series of research objects, uh, both data and software and uh, narrative. that are already essentially out there, but not necessarily very accessible. Yeah. To give you an example from the narrative side, um, you know, PubMed, we've had all this movement in open access. So we're talking about data now, but open knowledge through open access publishing has been around and been uh, policies that were put in place a number of years ago. And it's, you know, it's, it's been somewhat ex successful. About 15 to 20% of all the biomedical literature this year will, will be uh, open access um, from day one. Um, if it's funded by the NIH, it has to be open access after, um, after a year anyway. But so that's all available, but it's not to actually do something. So that means you can read a paper much more easily than you could otherwise. It doesn't necessarily impact institutions like this, which have a lot of access to literature. But if you're, believe me, if you're in a uh, developing world, it's a huge deal. And there's some beautiful stories of successes that have come from open access, but that's another story. The point here is, you know, you have, you, 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 that, is, which is currently in PubMed Central, uh, within the, the NIH is not particularly accessible. So the idea that that was actually also, was also maintained in that way, but was also seeded into this commons where it could be, you know, it could be dealt, it could be analyzed by, uh, uh, easily by a larger group of people and combined with other forms of data to make collections. I've seen, you know, and, and these are pressing issues. I've seen some very interesting collections recently associated with Ebola. So the idea that, you know, you know, there was a whole series of these research objects out there that reflected narrative on papers around uh, Ebola, uh, diff, you know, drug databases where information associated with Ebola could be extracted, where this could be started but put together. This is, you know, there's precedent for this, but it's not it's easy to do right now. So the idea that this, could, this kind of aggregation could happen in an easier way, 
uh, is definitely something we want to explore. And then finally, my question. It, at one point, journals were talking about requiring that a data set be posted supporting the analysis that was being presented in the paper. And I'm curious, is the NIH going to get involved with that? Is there some way that that could be a requirement at the time that the paper is accepted for publication as a way of jump-starting this idea of sharing at least uh, de-identified data? Yeah, so the, the, this is happening with some journals uh, already. The Public Library of Science, for example, and I, I was actually involved in this, will not actually publish a paper unless the, the associated data sets are available. And I think one of the ideas is that those particular data sets would have these digital object identifiers assigned to them in the same way that papers do, and they would be uh, accessible and linked uh, through, for example, through the Commons, but also to uh, activities at, uh, in, uh, at the NIH, and that, that, that's actually ongoing. So, you know, but I think there, there needs to be much, you know, that's, that's one set of publications and others are following. But it, it's not all of the biomedical literature. But there are drivers for this, and the reproducibility driver uh, is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that, you know, that funding may be lost to the system if we can't reproduce things better is driving uh, this, you know, this kind of notion. And the point that was made earlier about uh, software, and software is another part of this, uh, is, a, is an equal part. But there's, there's more to it than that. There's even all of the physical parts as well. Um, so if you're as a biospecimen database, there ought to be, if, 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 if you're using specific elements from that resource, then that should be, you know, well characterized in the paper. So at least there's a, you can return, you can resolve the source of that content, whether it be virtual or physical. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's moves afoot, for example, for assignment of identifiers to antibodies and so forth, so that they're... Uh, so that there can be, you know, you, you, we begin to characterize a paper in a much more quantitative way than we've done in the past. So let's just open it up to audience Q&A for five minutes and then we can uh, go up and have lunch. <laughs> Great presentation, thank you very much. I have a quick question. Uh, one of the things that is uh, you know, obviously necessary, and many people mentioned that constantly, uh, is access to full text articles to, you know, to do natural language processing and analyze it, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the obstacles is uh, the fact that there is no API or, you know, or programming interface to these types of uh, data resources. And another one is the copyright itself. So how NIH is involved or trying to address this because that's a big impediment in finding like a concrete example, finding um, you know a potential drug target for um, gen genetic variation that nobody have ever seen, and uh, for that you need uh, you know computers. People cannot do that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm not the first part. Uh, I think the the idea. I'm actually on the PubMed Central Advisory Board. And that's where the idea of putting that content into a much more accessible way. But I have to say that um, even with the literature, there are problems. So an example of that is that the, the literature itself is represented as XML, but it's not necessarily as standardized as it should be. Mm -hmm. so that because, and so the licensing record, which defines who can do what to that, that publication, is, is in a number of cases missing or just uninterpretable. So we're not absolutely clear uh, what, what the issues are. And this is, again, history repeating itself. So as people start to use the, the data on mass as a corpus, uh, they realize these problems and you know, they start to be addressed. So that kind of thing is now being address, addressed and it involves getting the publishers to, to, to sort of conform better. But, you know, publishers, it's very important that they be in PubMed and PubMed Central. That's where the main access points are to their, their content. So, you know, and then I think this Commons idea, one of the, the, the thoughts there is that, you know, it's no good waiting for a small group of people at the NIH to build APIs to this stuff. Let's make it accessible 
and then encourage the community to develop the APIs, which, of course, will be characterized. So that you'll be able... What you can't do now is you can't... How do I find an API to this stuff, right? Uh, and I think the idea is through these, these discovery indexes is not only will you be able to find the API, but you'll get some sense of its value because you'll be able to see how, of, how frequently it's been used and any commentary that people want to say about it. So this starts to take on, I don't, I don't want to necessarily use this term, but sort of almost like a Yelp-like uh, you know, context. Um, and so that was, that's sort of the, you know, the way that I see this heading. Um, and your second question was about resources to do... I'm sorry, I didn't quite get what you were trying to say in the second part. That, that, that was just a concrete example of where this type of analysis would be critical because it is impossible to do, you know, to, to keep in memory, uh, you know, all the types of genetic variations that can occur. You have to do, you know, really a good, uh, you know, natural language processing of uh, the body of literature to find out some obscure things. So. Okay, so I think that would this I would. Again, this needs to be, every part of this has to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. So I think if we, put, if we put this out there, maybe we, you know, we, 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 we make some awards to, I'm probably not supposed to be saying these things, we make some awards to uh, actually develop APIs to this content. And then I think equally important is we have to evaluate what the usage pattern is. And then we need to make you know, adjustments accordingly. You know, this is, I, I don't want to give the impression that any of the things that we're approaching here these big monolithic, you know, build it and they will come kind of approaches. This is really to do some nimble experiments over the next year or two uh, and see where we go with this. Could, if I could just add something. Yeah. So one of, one of the things that concerns me about the explosion of information is that we need to pay careful attention to what is not there, to missing data. Uh, patterns of missing are very important. We know in, in the uh, research literature that there's a real publication bias right, for positive findings, especially for smaller studies, et cetera. And I know in my own work with the electronic medical record system, studying where the patterns of missings were really helped us understand what the problems with the data were that we were dealing with. And if you don't ask those questions in a very systematic, very rigorous way, you can make very uh, ill-founded conclusions from the data in front of you. And I think when we then go up a whole other level of sharing data across data research sites, we have to be really, really careful about thinking about missing as creatively as we think about the data in front of us. Hi. Um, so when I was teaching my data journalism program this, this summer, we had a guest from ProPublica come talk to us about an interactive that they had developed there in their small data team where they sort of explained, they let people like search th through the Medicare data that had recently been open sourced. And then they sort of showed little graphics that explained, you know, for the doctor you found, maybe your doctor, this is their percentile rank in terms of how many times they've done this procedure. Or this is, you know, this is how many procedures they do, et cetera. And I remember thinking like, why is it up to a newspaper mm -hmm. to do that? Like w why isn't that being done by the federal agencies and why don't they have teams of data journalists who think about how the taxpayers who fund this stuff would like to interact with the research studies or with the data itself or, you know, or just the results or just even the funding for the research. <laughs> Consumer Report uh, would agree I, with I've that. only <laughs> been there six months. I don't have good answers. I mean, uh, there, I don't have good answers to it. I mean, I, it, there's no good reason. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. I mean, but... Uh, I think but there's, there are steps along the way. I mean, I think the, direct, the directive that, that came down from, you know, essentially the president about open data, that is really driving things in, in a different direction. And it's, op you know, the fact that, that people are now thinking for the first time, well, there's all this open data. You know, we can be doing, you know, we're doing these kinds of things. And, you know, I think it's, it's almost like, you know, uh, the internet, in a sense, what we've done, what we, we're, it's a th we're creating a thin layer on top of the internet. And then before we had that, we had no idea where it was going to go, but it went to amazing places. And a lot, so I think just by opening things up, in that case, it was creating a protocol, uh, you know, to allow communication. I mean, we need that here as well. It's not just about making the data open. We've got to have, 
you know, the idea that you can cause, you know, that there's commonality across these data elements that you can actually make these kinds of connections. And that's going to start, the, the, the value of that is going to start to come. And ultimately, you know, in my mind, all of this only gets driven by economics. The, 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 you know, the, the value proposition has to be there. And so, it, it, you know, it may not be a value proposition for the, uh, for the, uh, for the feds to do it themselves, but it should be it should be done through some kind of public private partnership, so that there's there's value all around, so that you could get that kind of information, but that whoever did that, let's say it was a third party, that they actually that whatever revenue they generated in so doing, uh, actually got fed back to support some of the the, the public data itself. So this is the ki these kinds of models, you know, and then you say, well, uh, would I pay for this service? And maybe you wouldn't, but you know, you know, there are lots of creative companies out there who p offer tons of free services but make lots of money. Microphone. They're bringing it. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just try to It brought up the other thing I wanted to say, which is. I'm going to push back a little bit on this concept of a business model in the context, because I've worked in business, I've worked in industry. Um, when we're talking about like NIH, we're talking about something that is funded by the taxpayer with lots and lots of money. And what I just mentioned is like a data science team, which would take maybe $100,000 to do, uh, maybe $200,000 to maintain like for a longer period of time. It's not going to pay off because it's going to be free. It's not going to pay off directly. But, and it's very hard to, to gauge what it means to be worthwhile in that context if it's a free, open source, you know, if it's open to the public. But on the other hand, the public will probably appreciate it, at least the ones that interact with it. I'm just, I'm just making the point that when we talk about business models, it, it sends off red flags that you want to be able to measure like the, wor the worth of something, which isn't always easy to do when you're talking about public interest. This is a public interest agency. So to some extent, we have to assume that, that things that open it up to people are in their best interest. We can ask them if they think so, but you're not going to be able to get revenue from that kind of thing. And I, I don't think you should. That's just my opinion. But no, I, I mean, I take you. your point, and it was the best answer I could come up with. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said before I started saying that, I don't have necessarily have good answers for this. I mean, I, I, I've become way more sympathetic than I was in the past to that this would only cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars to do this. Well, the problem is, of course, there are many different of those kinds of, of opportunities, and it's actually, you know, and it is a lot of money that the NIH has, but it is still nevertheless limited, you know, has a limit. And so maybe we just need to prioritize things more. But I can tell you, talking to investigators who, you know, when that priority doesn't agree with what, you know, the fact that they're no longer being funded, it's really tough, and, you know, but. I think keeping the public's interest at the forefront of all of this well, clearly is, is obviously you know, critical. Mark? Yeah. So, um, Phil, sort of following on from this uh, question, you talked about the fact that um, you know, good data is very expensive. It's expensive to generate, expensive to maintain. And I was curious, do you have now or will the NIH be developing literally a, like a distribution of data costs or values that one could look at? Like, do you have a sense now of like what's, what's expensive, you know, in terms of dollars per gigabyte or, you know, what's an expensive data set, what's an inexpensive data set? Are there actual numbers that you can quote or that we could find on a website? Um, no, I mean, I don't really have, and I have to say a lot of this comes from my experience with data and various resources over the years of what I observe uh, in, the, in, in these other resources. but. What I would say is that what we're not doing enough of by the virtue of the way we fund these things, and I kind of alluded to this, but just to restate it, and perhaps hopefully a little better, is we're not transferring best practices enough. We're not, you know, we're not, we're not working enough together to, to understand what really works well for tools that are really useful for curating this data set, methodologies we've used to curate this data set. You know, those, those, even though it might be different data, that often, tra you know, the process can often transfer. And that, off that you know, d doesn't happen. And I mean, I'm not talking just about uh, what happens in, in different areas of genomics. I'm talking about what could happen. What I've learned recently is that NOAA uh, is doing some very interesting things with atmospheric and ocean data, 
uh, and they have models for public-private partnership and they have models for curation and they have models for the, that I would, you know, as a researcher, I never discovered. So I think if, if we can start to, you know, we're now all meeting because of these open data things. Maybe there's hope. I mean, I'm a hope, you know, I have hope that, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I say I'm not a Fed. I, I'm just not worn down by it, trying to do. But there is there is all this crosstalk going on, and maybe some value can come from it. But I don't have specific examples. I do know. I mean, I can tell you, as as you know, just one data resource right now, something like the Protein Data Bank, just in the U.S., that's a six million dollar a year enterprise, and probably three million dollars of that is spent uh, more than that. Actually, four to five million dollars is spent on the curation activities for that data, and we could, we could talk a little about that offline, but I think uh, that clearly has had enormous impact and value on that community. But I think going forward, we, we ought to be thinking about you know, uh, other models as well. There's a question here. Thank you. Phil, can you say a little bit more, uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, but a little bit about the expectations that the NIH has for the institutions that are supporting these researchers? What would you like them to be able to offer? What do you think they need to offer um, in terms of infrastructure policies and guidance and so forth? I think what I'm most interested in is what we do with the people. So it's really, because that's the, the lifeblood and then that, they, that comes from the institutions. But so these you know, various training initiatives um, and what we can do to really foster this, this training. And also I would say, you know, coming back to my point about valuing uh, people within, within the organization. You know, the, the so-called data scientists and project scientists who are very important to the enterprise and, and I think are becoming more so you know, are we appreciating those enough in the system? Is there enough soul searching uh, within institutions uh, that these people are being well taken care of? So I'd say, and, and that, you know, and the, and the training, and, and certainly the diversity of training, which is a, a big thing for the NIH. So I would say those are just sort of re re recapping or, uh, of things that I'd really like to see uh, institutions happen. And I, and I think also one of the reasons I'm here, of course, is to have much more of a dialogue with individual institutions that are pushing in this direction. Um, you know, I mean, I, I just know from where I came before I was there that there was, in the Southern California region, there was uh, a huge demand for people doing this kind of work. There were 4,500 open jobs. And yet at that time, UC San Diego was not actually training. We had no data science program. Uh, per se, and uh, th there was sudden realization that you know this this had to happen, in part because we didn't get some uh, important data science grants, which had to show that there was a data science component already in place. That was a wake up call for our institution, and now I think there's you know this notion of uh, of really thinking about this, and actually even thinking about it in the context of this digital enterprise idea where you start to break down the silos between these respective uh, parts. I mean, it, there's just no question that there are discoveries that are made of, of connections between investigators, of course, when they read each other's papers. But there's a possibility that th those connections could have been discovered if some tools had actually looked at their data. They don't actually have to reveal the data, but if, you're, if there's a tool that looks at pat for patterns in data and finds two data sets from two investigators in two different departments who would never come into contact, and yet there's some commonality there. I mean, you have to be careful of a fatigue alert and all these sorts of things, but there's at least the potential that you would actually discover the commonality, and those two people could be put in contact with each other um, without revealing the data, and they can make of it what they can. And, and that would happen essentially the day that the second data set was actually created and essentially in this commons or in this public space, um, even if it was institutional commons. So, you know, I think it's a way for institutions to create much more collab. There are the opportunities are beginning to be seen for creating opportunities for collaboration within institutions that don't, which are not, you know, not the traditional ways of doing things and having them happen much more quickly than waiting for uh, the published literature. 